Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. So let's get started and look into the first article. So the first article of discussion is about Freedom of Literature Bill 2018. So even before we look into the features of this particular bill, let's look at it from a brief background. So India is a land of diversity. We are a country with myriad customs, religions as well as aspirations. Authors thereby are given the freedom to practice their profession as enshrined in the constitution under article 19 but this is violated time and again curtailing the freedom of expression as well as the practice of profession thereby violating fundamental rights orchestrated by the constitution in the past as well there were books that authors had written and these never surfaced in the public forum why because of the oat bank politics because of the conservative groups which did not want the liberal thoughts to be spread outside in the society there was patriarchy in the society and existence of caste bias and hegemony within the society which wanted to dominate and as a result of all this authors books and articles were never published let's take some of the examples there was one of the books written by the Wendy Doniger's the Hindus and alternative history and this was withdrawn from circulation AK Ramanujam's essay 300 Ramayanas was dropped from Delhi University syllabus Tamil writer Perumal Murugan's Mathura Bhagan was also withdrawn by author under the mob pressure. So we have n number of examples and what has the Supreme Court said? The Supreme Court has time and again in all these judgments have said that in case you want to read a particular book, want to watch a particular movie, go watch it. You have no right to stop another person from reading it or watching a particular movie. You don't like this particular book or you don't like a particular movie, please don't watch it. But if you want to stop another person from reading it that is not going to be entertained but has this thought been laid or paid heed to not exactly why because of the political masters so the political masters want to keep their oat bank politics intact and that is why in the garb of public order in the garb of national unity in the garb of socio and religious harmony and using these principles time and again they have invoked this particular practice of curtailing the freedom of the author so in order to overcome this particular issue, parliamentarian Shashi Tharoor has introduced this freedom of literature bill in the Lok Sabha with the aim of increasing this literary freedom given to the authors in the country. So what does this bill basically do? So this bill basically aims to remove all those outdated sections in terms of the religion as well as the obscenity laws that are present in India in terms of the IPC, in terms of the CRPC or indecent representation of the women or the custom acts so all these laws that are there in the Indian structure this will be reworked and that is the intention of Shashi Tharoor and that is why he as a member of parliament has introduced this particular bill let's try and understand what are the features of this particular bill so the two important paradigms is one on the religious aspect the other on the obscenity level let's try to understand this at the religious level first so there is one of the sections called as section 295a as well as section 298 of the IPC so what does section 295a say it says deliberate and malicious acts intended to outrage religious feelings of any class by insulting its religion or religious beliefs and the second section says uttering words or etc with deliberate intent to wound the religious feelings of any person so when you look into these two sections section 295a as well as 290 298 IPC what you will see is that these are pronounced in a very vague way so what do you mean by outrage religious feelings what do you mean by intent to old does it mean that it has a definite meaning not actually so they are very vague they are very broad and anyone can have a subjective interpretation of it so when there is subjective interpretation this will become an arbitrary used by the executive so what this particular bill goes on to say is there needs to be omission of this particular section 295A and 298 of the IPC. Why? Because it is subjective, it can be arbitrarily used and because it is too broad and too wide and too vague, this can be used by the executive according to whims and their fancies. So what this particular section is indirectly doing is it is suppressing alternative views that have been expressed by the writers, 
thinkers as well as scholars so what Sashi Tharoor has gone on to say is this particular sections of the IPC that is 295A as well as 298 is completely vague and has to be removed from the Indian law books another key important argument he goes on to speak about is in terms of the obscenity so let's look into section 67 of the IT Act so what does it basically go on to say it says punishment for publishing or transmitting obscene material in electric form it says whoever publishes or transmit or causes to be published or transmitted in electronic form any material which is laxivious or appeals to prurient interest or tends to deprave or correct persons shall be punished let's try and understand this section 67 of the IT Act so what does this section 67 of the IP Act basically say in case there is any of the obscene pictures or any obscene material and it is transmitted via an electronic platform then such person can be punished this is what this particular section of the IT Act say but what we have to understand is between the years 2002 and 2015 section 67 of the IT Act was highest use section in the IT Act after section 66 and when you look into the statistics from the year 2008 to 2015 the number of cases filed under this section 67 has continuously started increasing from about 105 to about 749 let's take a simple example as to how the number of cases have increased with respect to this section 67 of the IT hack let's say there is a politician and what you have you have n number of these apps that you currently have where people start using it and when you have a politician who happens to be a prime minister or a chief minister and when you take a particular picture who is a look alike of this particular politician and when you use it to superimpose with certain props like the snapchat dog filter then even such things are called as obscene and then these people are put behind bars so the now the question comes is what is obscene what is the meaning of obscene do they have any static meaning of it do they have a definite meaning of it do they have a rigid meaning of it no we do not have have any such definition of obscene so when there are filters that are used like in the snapchat doc filter they are just arrested in the name of it because they feel that it is obscene so the executive here are using their arbitrary actions in the whims and fancies just to appease their political masters so what do we mean by it there is no definition of obscenity here and because the definition is very subjective and is remaining unclear over a period of time there has been increase of the cases from about 105 to 749 and it has been used highest when it comes to the IT Act after the section 66 so what this means is it is become very subjective and this leads to whims and fancies of the executive who are listening to their political masters and at the same time there are other set of sections that we will also have to consider let's look at section 293 of the IPC where it says sale etc of obscene objects to young person so what does it mean who Whoever sells, lets to hire, distributes, exhibits or circulates to any person under the age of 20 years what is called as obscene objects will have to be punished. But what we have to understand here is in India any person becomes a major at the year of 18. So when there is a person who can vote for a political party when he is able to drive where he gets the driving license why is this restricted at the age group of 20. So what this particular bill goes on to say is this will have to be removed by about 18 years what is currently at 20 years will have to be reduced to about 18 years so organically section 67 of the IT Act section 293 of the IPC has certain fundamental flaws within itself as to what obscenity means so what are we supposed to do we have to bring changes that is why Shashi Tharoor says that we will have to make changes accordingly another key important argument that he also goes on to speak about is in reference to section 95 as well as 96 of the CRPC so what are these two sections basically when you have the state government or the central government in case the state government or the central government feels that there is a particular article in the newspaper or there is a particular book immediately in case they feel it's disturbing the nation's unity they can come up with a notification and completely 
bar this particular book from released into the particular forum so what Shashi Tharoor goes on to say is this is under the hegemony of the government and such things should not be happening so he also wants section 95 as well as section 96 of the CRPC completely replaced and also have to be changed at the same time there are certain custom acts which actually prohibits a certain books from being imported so he also wants section of this customs act to also be changed so that this particular book can also be imported from the foreign country so all in all what this bill goes on to do is it wants to bring about change in the Indian Penal Code Code of the Criminal Procedure Customs Act as well as indecent representations of the Women Act so that this particular obscene as a material which is currently there is not suitably defined it is very vague and subjective so it is led to the whims and fancies of the executive so all these will have to be suitably changed and these suitably changed changed one and the bill also introduced certain amendments to it so that is why Shashi Tharoor has come up with this particular bill so what is the conclusion that we will have to understand so this is actually a very welcome step by Shashi Tharoor which can be a step towards removing or diluting any penal provisions that inhibit literary freedom so what the political masters will have to right now think is irrespective of what the political parties they are in irrespective of whether there is a private bill or a public bill they'll have to pay to this particular bill they'll have to reason it out and also introduce this is what this article all about so so let's look into the next article so even before we look into the next article let's take up one of the prelims practice question so the Kuril Island is a dispute between Russia and Japan so why are we discussing this that is because there is one of the editorials that is there with respect to today's discussion that is why this becomes a very key important question when it comes to your map based question so this is one of the important questions that can be a potential question asked in your GS paper 2 in the international relations so the Kuril Islands is a dispute between Japan as well as Russia so let's try and understand what this article is all about so when you go back to the background after the second World War the entire political geography of the world was rewritten as these political maps were rewritten many countries were born and also the disputes were also given rise to so one such dispute is the Israel Palestine dispute you also have the India Pakistan China dispute and one such dispute amongst the world is the Kuril Islands and this Kuril Island dispute is between Russia as well as Japan so let's try and understand what this Kuril Islands is all about so this Kuril Islands are an archipelago of about 56 islands spanning about 1800 kilometers from the Japan's Kokido to Russia's Kamchatka and all of this have been under the Russian jurisdiction after the Second World War. So let's try to understand what the history of the Kuril dispute is. Let's go back to the year 1855. So the Treaty of Shimodo was signed and this gives southern Kurils to Japan and rest of the island chain to China. So this particular part was Japan's and this which is currently showcased in blue is part of Russia and this was according to 1855 treaty that is treaty of Shimodo then we have 1875 and that is the treaty of St. Petersburg and this sits all Kurils to Japan in exchange of Russian jurisdiction over Sakhalin so the entire part that we see up till the south of Russia became part of Japan and then you have 1905 after Russia's defeat in Russo-Japanese war Japan gains control of the southern Sakhalin so this is the Sakhalin island this southern part was also taken over by Japan and then we have the second world war Soviet Union occupies entire Kuril chain and southern Sakhalin after declaring war on Japan during final days of world war one so this entire part of Kuril from the second world war till date has been taken over by Russia so this is the background when it comes to what the dispute is so what is the current dispute so when you look into the current dispute what Moscow claims is after the second world war happened there was entire change in the political map and that is why we as a country have won over and we as a country because we won in the second world war the entire Kuril Islands will be coming up under the jurisdiction of Russia but what does Japan say so Japan says under the Treaty of Shimodo as well as Treaty of St. Petersburg we do have certain places so what does Japan basically say is there are certain islands like the Itorofu 
Kunarishi, Shitkopon, as well as the Homobai. So all these islands, according to the treaty that we have signed in 1855 as well as 1875, these islands should be coming up under the Japan's jurisdiction. So from then, from 1945. Till now, this particular dispute has not been resolved. That's the overall idea of this particular dispute. So the next question that pops up is, why is that this particular islands become a significant factor? So what is the importance of these islands? Why are Russia fighting for it? Why is Japan fighting for it? This becomes a point of understanding. So what is the significance is, the most important point that we have to first understand is the strategic importance. So what is the key strategic importance that we are speaking about? So what Russia feels is, Russians currently have deployed n number of missile systems. It has a submarine project. It also wants to make sure that in case there is any future problems because of United States of America, it would be able to prevent the American military use on this particular island. Why? Because Japan and United States of America are close allies. So because they are very close, what Japan can also do is, it can host American bases as well as the missile systems and we know for the fact that Russia and United States of America from the Cold War era have certain enmity. So what Russia feels is in case Japan happens to go on to host American bases as well as missile systems, this could be a potential threat to Russia. That is why this has a strategic imperative. And what is the strategic imperative? Russia is deploying its own submarine bases just to make sure that America does not use these islands to prompt a war against Russia. So this is something to do with the strategic imperative. Another key important point is something to do with the political impact. So what is the political impact that we are speaking about? So when we consider the politics of these two countries, both these countries have democracy. So both the countries have democracy and it is run by the will of the people. But these people who are there within this particular region do not want to give up these islands. And in the past, what has happened is after 1945, there were certain islands which were accommodated by the Japanese people as well. And when Japanese people were actually taken over and they were asked to leave these islands. So there was burning enmity between Russia as well as Japan. So what the people consider is they do not want any concession whatsoever and they do not want to let go these islands because of the past enmity. And as a result of this, what the right wing politicians as well as certain conservative circles within this particular area want is they do not want to give up these islands. Even if they want to establish peace, they do not want to and that is why this particular dispute has always remained eternally. So the key important point is one is on the strategic front where Russia does not want the United States of America to occupy these islands and become a threat to Russia and the second is the political impact where in case they happen to go on to adjust and make sure there are mutual obligations these set of people who are conservatives and right wing politicians are not ready to and that is why there can be no concession as the political parties in case they go on to compromise they may lose their elections so these are the two important things however over a period of time what we have seen is there have been certain steps that have been taken care by both the governments for active engagements. So you have the Russian government, you also have the Japanese government. They want to engage to make sure that those people who are currently there in these islands have some benefits. So what are these things? So in the year 2016, what we saw was that President Putin made a visit to Japan in the year 2016. So both these governments came up together, they made an understanding, they started negotiating and they started questioning why are we fighting so much it's ultimately the people's will yes we do understand that but what is also important is peace between both of us so in order to make sure that there is peace between Russia as well as Japan both these countries came up together and they started adjusting and what is that they did they started establishing joint field surveys joint economic activities identifying certain specific projects within these islands infrastructure development economic development and making sure there is employment to all these people within this particular region and they came up with number of projects 
like the marine species and aquaculture, greenhouse strawberry, vegetable cultivation, development of tourism. So they came up with wind power generation, reduction and disposal of garbage. So they came up with number of all these projects so that there is peace and tranquility that have been established. As we initially discussed, there were people who were staying in these islands. So these Japanese were asked to push off to the mainland Japan. But now currently they have also entered into an agreement where all those people who were once moved out of this particular island territories are asked to come back visit the graveyards of their forefathers so there is mutual understanding so and people are also compromising and there are also other engagements between japan as well as with the russian counterparts so what we have to understand here is why was this position taken is it all about economy and infrastructure not actually there are other concerns as well so what are the concerns currently what we see is this china has become a global threat to all those people in and around on one side you have the south china sea issue on the other side there is rapid rise of china which could be a problem to the japanese as well so in order to convince and make sure that this particular chinese will not be a threat to the japan japan is getting closer to russia why because in case there is a future threat japanese would be able to take the support of russia so in order to make sure that there is ample amount of support from russia the Japanese have taken this particular move another key important point is we also have threat from the North Korea so North Korea always sees that Japan is an ally of United States of America and it has recently even tested two ballistic missiles over Japan as it wants to taunt United States of America so on one side you have threat that is coming from China on the other side there has been nuclear missiles which has tested just closer by to Japan so in order to make sure this does not happen in the future Japan has got closer to the Russians as well and next key important point is there are certain pockets of islands which are owned by Russia so these are the pockets that are there on the southern parts of Russia and these regions and the southeast region of Russia has plenty of resources so what Japan is also anticipating is that it wants to develop these particular regions so that this could be a platform of investment so apart from the economic calibrate that we see in these Kuril islands there are certain other southeastern parts which are not developed these islands will be taken over by Japan and these are the areas which are undisturbed they have lot of natural resources so Japan wants to make sure it can extract maximum from these particular areas so that they can also make an investment and lead to much better understanding between Russia as well as Japan so what is that we can understand from this particular dispute so both these countries which are superpowers in their own paradigm have come up together they found people as an objective so they let go all their disputes and they wanted to empower people so they came up with the developmental projects so what India and Pakistan can also do is take this as an example and treat people as an objective introduce certain projects within this particular area forget these disputes temporarily so that there is increase in the economy there is increase in the tourism factor and what we require for this is certain strong leadership as well as bold imagination if leadership is able to come up with it what we can do is irrespective of what will happen in the future the leadership will have to come together take certain bold steps engage and make sure that there is mutual benefit for the people and there is tranquility in this particular region so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so even before we look into let's understand a prelims practice question the staff service commission is a attached office so let's look into the article for the same so what we have to understand is that there was one of the parliamentary standing committee and this has recommended the center to award certain statutory status to the staff selection commission which is one of the largest recruitment agencies in the country so even before we understand what this article is all about let's look into some of the statistics with respect to the staff selection commission so this is an attached office of the department of personal and training and the headquartered at new delhi it comprises of chairman two members and a secretary come controller of examinations who are appointed on such terms and conditions as may be prescribed by the government from time to time so the estimates committee of the parliament 
in its 47th report recommended the setting of service election commission for conducting examinations for recruitment to lower categories of posts so the government of india in the department of personal and administrative reforms wide its resolution constituted a commission which is called as the subordinate service commission which has subsequently been redesigned as the staff selection commission effective for 1977 so what we have to understand is what are the functions of ssc so when we look into the functions of ssc this is one of the recruiting bodies which is an attached office under the department of personnel and training and what does it do it recruits the people for the group b as well as the group c non technical post so being the recruitment agency goes about recruiting people for the lower post in the government of india so what does the mp panel go on to say so you have the union public service commission which is a constitutional body and the state public service commission and you also have the other relevant agencies which are given the statutory status but this ssc was initially formed so that it can ease the burden of the upsc but why was it created upsc was existent and because the work of upsc started increasing in order to release some burden of the upsc ssc was created so when ssc was actually created the work was very less so it was looking at recruitment process for the group c as well as the group c employees but over a period of time its recruitment process has become on a larger scale so let's look into the statistics so when we look into the statistics initially during the 2008 and 09 there were only 9.94 lakh candidates but in the year 2016 and 17 the candidates who applied for the group c as well as group b grew up to over 2 crore so there has been an increase in the work that has been done by the ssc so being an attached office it has to entirely depend on the government of india for all its needs and it has no autonomy on its own so it is not able to work efficiently and it is not able to deliver goods as per the intended standards though it was initially came up to ease the burden of upsc now Now it is working more than the UPSC, and the number of job applicants have also increased. So this will require more independence, more autonomy, and more freedom. And rather than sticking everything with the government of India, it needs certain independence. So what we the MP panel are recommending is give it a statutory status. And when you are providing it a statutory status by law, this will give them some functional autonomy, and this will also give them faster decision making, thereby efficiency as well. Well as overall performance will improve which will help in the recruitment process so what has also being done is there was one of the expert committee that was appointed by the government in the year 2014 for reviewing the examination system in the ssc and this particular committee has also recommended according statutory status to the commission so all in all what this particular MP panel has gone on to say is currently when you have it as an attached office under the department of personnel and training this has to be given a statutory status so that efficiency of this staff selection commission improves as a overall paradigm so this is what we need to understand in reference to this article so let's look into the next article so the next article says under staff cbi a concern says the panel so what is the context here so anything anywhere that happens in india let's take for example a celebrity who is killed and what is the call of the pol political parties hand it over to the cbi let's say there is financial irregularities economic offense just like how we discussed yesterday with respect to the vijay malya and what is the call of the political parties hand it over to the cbi let's say there is an internal security problem let's say there is a cyber crime issue or let's say there is international ramifications as cbi is the interpol and what is the call of the political parties give it to the cbi so for all this the only call of the political parties hand over this particular a case to the cbi because the cbi is one of the premier investigating agencies but now what is the problem that we face is that the number of people who are working within the cbi are either understaffed and as a result of this the efficiency of cbi has reduced so the parliamentary standing committee has raised this particular concern over non filling of vacancies in the cbi and they are going on to say that this will impact the performance of the cbi and have come up with certain recommendations recommendations so what are the recommendations that they have come up with firstly what they have gone on to say is you will have to simplify recruitment rules to overcome procedural bottlenecks 
so currently you have a particular procedure this has certain ambiguous area and the structure is not completely defined so come up with a proper structure define a proper set of rules so that people and the administration are able to understand how they can get into the CBI so make sure that all these bottlenecks that are currently there in the system is reduced so that the recruitment process becomes an easy one and the next key important point that it goes on to make is the government may consider taking the terms of deputation more rewarding in to retain the capable officers so what do we mean by it let's take for example there are certain police officers the IPS officers who are taken on deputation from the state government to the CBI as well and these people after deputation of about five years three years get back to their state cadres what this particular MP panel has gone on to say is make sure that you are giving them more rewarding consignments giving them more opportunities giving them more more salary and also conveniences when you're doing all these things these people would want to work for the CBI so you're providing them reward so that they don't have to go back to the state poll forces or the central paramilitary forces or the intelligence bureau so you're providing them the provision to work more because you're rewarding them for the work that they have done so the second key argument that he says is make the deputation more rewarding and the third thing that we have to understand here is there is one of the important centers called as the ICEI CBI Center so what is this this is an international center of excellence in investigation and this particular center was supposed to be established in the CBI Academy that is currently there in Ghaziabad and what will this center basically do so this particular center will give investigation tools as well as courses to do with cyber crime as well as other prosecution tools but in spite of this particular establishment that was supposed to be surfaced in 2015 we do not still have this particular establishment so what the committee has gone on to recommend is that CBI and the government should expedite the approvals for setting up this particular center so in order to address all this these three recommendations will have to be followed is what the MP panel has gone on to say so this is what we need to understand in relevance to this article so moving on let's look into some of the prelims practice questions so it says that Shigam National Park is in the state of Jammu and Kashmir why have we discussed this because we have one of the articles that is there on your Hindu which says a critically endangered Kashmir stack known as Hangul searching for food at Dashigam National Park near Srinagar which is in Jammu and Kashmir also remember the IUCN status of Kashmir stag is critically endangered so two key important points from the prelims perspective is the Dashigam National Park is in Jammu and Kashmir and Kashmir stag has an IUCN status of critically endangered so let's look into the mains practice question it says discuss the free features of the freedom of literature bill 2018 and comment how this will promote the spirit of democracy so kindly write all your answers on the comment section so that the Baiju's team can evaluate and you can also have a peer review amongst yourself so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best